Good afternoon, my name is John Stafford. I'm uh, about to present on the 2020 Washington State Legislative Session with an eye towards the implications for the 2021 Legislative Session. Uh, I'm uh, presenting here in my condominium unit uh, on Beacon Hill. Uh, so, the agenda for this afternoon is threefold. First, I am going to provide an overview of what happened in Olympia this past year. Uh, the first couple months of the, the year of the legislative session. I'm going to talk about what sorts of progress uh, was made during the legislative session on public policy, and then I'll talk about implications for 2021. Uh, first, starting with a little bit of context, most of you will already know this, but it's important to sort of set the stage. Um, the state uh, wa of Washington operates on a biennium basis, so we operate in two-year cycles. Um, odd years are long sessions and even years are short sessions. And what I mean by that, therefore, was let's say 2019, an odd year, that was a long session, 105 days. 2020, which I'm going to talk about, was a short session, 60 days. And next year then will again be a long session, 105 days, so we go back and forth. Why is that? Um, because uh, it deals with the budget cycle. Washington State creates three budgets, an operating budget, which is by far the biggest and most important, a transportation budget, and a capital budget. Those are listed here. They're created in the odd-numbered years, and then in the even-numbered years, they're adjusted for things like caseloads, inflation rates, etc. So they're just modified a bit. And in addition to the uh, budget work, there's, of course, uh, several thousand bills introduced each year, and uh, not a high percentage of them pass, but some do. So I'll be talking about the, both budget issues and uh, other legislation. Uh, and the theme of this last session, which was a short session, uh, was homelessness. Okay? So just a bit of context. All right. Um, what were some themes, sort of some observations I'll make about 2020? Um, uh, and I will say right up front, in my view, this was a very problematic, low-achieving session, to give some overall context. Uh, first, the budget does not reflect the economic threat of the coronavirus. So the virus, of course, is wreaking havoc on the state's economy. That's going to lead to far less revenues going to Olympia. But that wasn't fully appreciated when the legislators were in session. So they created a budget that really didn't fully account for that. That's a big problem. I don't mean to be judgmental about that because people didn't fully appreciate the situation. But nevertheless, it remains a big problem. I'll talk more about that. Um, there's no new source of revenue, and I say this quite regularly, we have a regressive tax structure in this state. We desperately need a, a progressive source of uh, taxation. That didn't happen this session. That's a major failure of the session and of the ones that preceded it. Um, I argue that the legislative session was marked by timidity, insufficient uh, insufficiently bold goals and insufficiently bold, therefore, achievements. Um, and that stands in stark contrast to uh, the prior year. That should say 2019, I'm sorry. Um, and we are positioned for a, an extremely challenging 2021 session. Um, as challenging as any, if not more so, uh, than any state legislative session uh, in history. And we have four crises that need to be addressed. There's the public health crisis uh, of COVID-19, of course. There's the economic crisis that's happening as a result of that and therefore concurrently. And we have a social crisis, and by that I mean that we are all uh, well aware of the fact that the public health crisis and the econo um, economic crisis are disproportionately impacting lower income and minority communities. So we have a social crisis uh, uh, driven by these two crises that also has to be addressed. Finally, there's the budget crisis that I've referred to. There's not going to be enough revenue and expenses are going to be too high in Olympia, which necessitate budget cuts. Okay, um, so let's talk about coronavirus and the state budget. So, coronavirus, COVID-19 will have a devastating impact on the state's finances. There's an article in this today's Seattle Times on that and there will be many more. Um, and the reason is simple. 
As I mentioned, state revenues are about to go down significantly. Less business activity means businesses pay less tax to Olympia. People being laid off, they don't buy as many goods, they pay less sales tax to Olympia. Property tax receipts will go down. So the state's revenues are about to drop at the very time when sta the states, many of the state's expense categories are going to go up for providing health care, mental health, unemployment benefits, etc to deal with the pandemic. So we have a very bleak situation. All these crises and less resources to deal with them. Okay, um, And this was not fully anticipated when they wrote the 2020 budget. Again, I'm not criticizing legislators for this because they didn't appreciate it. But here's a quote um, from as late as March 2nd from Steve O'Ban, not bringing him up to criticizing him, just a, a, a representative quote. As, as work continues in Olympia toward adopting a new supplemental budget to fund day-to-day -day state government operations, the state legislator, legislature finds itself in the enviable position of having more money than expected. Okay, so that's March 20th. They finished the budget shortly thereafter, and now the whole world's been turned up, upside down. We don't have more money than expected. We have far less money in the billions of dollars than expected. So we have moved in... Uh, move from a situation that looked good to a situation that looks bleak. Um, and this is going to have significant implications. The state legislators will almost for sure be called into a delayed special session. That means Governor Inslee, uh, due to the crises, will call legislators back to Olympia. Uh, they've already completed their regular session, but call them back for a special session. That's a virtual certainty. Uh, in my view, it should have already happened, but, that, but that's uh, a bit of a digression. Um, and there's going to be budget cuts in 2021. There's no way around it. Um, and given the uh, health crisis, the economic crisis, and the social crisis, that creates an immense challenge. How to deal with the crises in a budget crisis situation. Okay. Um, all right, so moving on to uh, an observation about this legislative session. I'm not going to go through all the details here. The slide is intended to make one point. Last year, in the full session, 2019, the state made changes in a number of areas which collectively uh, represented significant change in the way that the state operates. This year, no structural change. Very disappointing. So briefly, last year there were a uh, change made in climate area to move to 100% renewable energy by 2045. K-12 education, the completion of the McCleary work, there's still some loose ends, but by and large finished. Guaranteed scholarship, uh, college financing for those in need, uh, nation leader in that area. Public option for health care, uh, mental health moving from centralized, a centralized model with uh, eastern and western state hospitals for mental health care to a community model, which is a big change. That's underway. Some pills passed on gun control, progress on statewide mail-in ballots, uh, lots of very important, momentous changes, but not in 2020. So that's the, the, the point, okay? Um, and to comment further on that, one has to ask the question, why are we not taking advantage of strong Democrat majorities in Olympia to pass more progressive legislation? Why are we... Uh, losing, uh, not taking advantage of an opportunity to make more structural change when we have the, uh, uh, the constituents, the majorities to do so. So Washington State ha is one of 15 states in the country with a Democratic trifecta. Democratic governor, control of the uh, Olympia House, control of the Olympia Senate. This just shows that graphically. Here's the Senate, here's the House. After Obama was elected, uh, 2012, the Democrat uh, majority uh, uh, was eliminated, but now it's back. So there's a 28 to 21 Democrat majority in the Senate, and the same pattern occurred in the House, and now we have a, a 16 seat advantage in the House. Um, so again, the point is, this is a very uh, fortuitous uh, situation for Democrats. We should be taking advantage of, advantage of it, not squandering the opportunity to not make momentous change when we could. Okay. Um, all right, so a summary of 2020 legislative session. The session lacked vision from the start, and it lacked meaningful progress. There's no major structural change, no new source of progressive revenue. 
Uh, the budgets do not leave the state well prepared for the COVID impacts. Those are going to now have to be addressed in this upcoming session. Uh, I already mentioned the fact that there's no revenue. Um, there was insufficient progress on climate change uh, and the environment in the last session. Um, and as I've said and will continue to say, in my opinion, it was an overly timid session. Okay. Um, all right, so a brief overview of 2020. Uh, now I'll go into a little more detail in specific areas of policy. And the first of those will be tax policy. So um, we need a, high, a tax on high income earners, period, end of story. Washington state does not have an income tax. Almost all states do. That makes us regressive. We don't have a capital gains tax. Almost all states do. That makes us regressive. We rely, therefore, on the sales tax. Other states rely far less on that. That makes us regressive. Even our business tax, which taxes revenues, not profits, is regressive. So we've known about this for a long time, and we haven't dealt with it. And now we've sort of gotten caught with our pants down because we need the revenue from affluent individuals, and we don't have it going into 2021. This needs to change. OK. Um, OK, so this sort of shows what I showed on the last chart. I'll start on the right side. So this is tax regressivity, meaning what percent of a person's income is paid in tax? And we take the poorest residents in the state. Our poorest residents pay almost 18% of their income in tax Okay, to Olympia. Uh, that uh, makes us 50 out of 50 in the country. Our poorest residents pay the highest percentage of their incomes of, uh, in taxation of any people in the country. That's shameful, uh, especially for an allegedly progressive liberal state. Um, here's the U.S. average. So we're the worst. Um, level of taxation measured as the total state and local taxation per thousand dollars of income, so we're measuring the percent of your income that you pay in taxes, we're a little bit lower than the U.S. average, okay? So the point of the slide is we're kind of a low tax state overall and very, very regressive, okay? And I'll just make one more point here. What this means is that our lower income individuals get fewer services because we're low tax and the services they do receive they have to pay more for than other states. So it's a, a, a two-pronged um, sort of attack, so to speak, on our uh, lower income residents. All right. Um, okay, and just some history. This shows uh, Washington state total taxes, state and local, as a percent of personal income um, relative to the national average. So the national average is the zero, per zero line right through the middle. And it makes a simple point. Back in, uh, starting in 1990, but even before then, we were a high tax state. We taxed our residents at a higher than the average state rate. And year after year, that's been chipped away. Some of this is due to Tim Iman initiatives, etc. cetera. Uh, and now we've emerged as a low tax state. So again, this impacts negatively the provision of services to our um, lower economic uh, residents. Um, okay. And my final slide that sort of elaborates on this, this combines overall tax intensity, how much we're paying in taxes, with regressivity. So I plot every state. This is what percent of um, taxes or personal income is paid in state and local taxes. These are high tax states here. These are low tax. So Washington, this is the median, is low tax. And this is regressivity. Here's, these are states that, where the poor pay more. These are states where the poor pay less. So you can see we're way below any state in the percentage of our the taxes that our poorest citizens pay. And we're low tax. And I just drew a couple arrows here. One, this would be taking us to Oregon's position. Uh, much less regressive, a little higher tax. One to the median on both measures and one to California. In all cases, we'd be raising taxes and lowering regressivity. So we're an outlier in, uh, amongst states in taxation. Okay, so our level of taxation is low. We have the most uh, regressive tax structure in the nation. Don't, we don't have an income tax or a capital gains tax. Um, we are regularly evaluated as having the most unjust tax system in the nation. Uh, from organizations such as ITEP. Um, and I'm going to make one more subtle point. If I were to ask most residents, most individuals, why do we have such a regressive tax system? 
The overwhelming response, which would be accurate in my view, would be rich people want to keep their money. Uh, what's wrong with you? They don't want to give it uh, to the state in taxes. Uh, this is a first grade question. And I understand that and agree with it. But I'll add this motivation as well, which I think is more diabolical but equally important as a motivator. By constraining the level of taxation, that also constrains the liberal agenda, meaning uh, we meet regularly in the 37th district and talk about resolutions to, let's say, for example, raise funding for veterans. And we have debates that go as follows. Yes, we're liberals and we're progressive, so yes, we want to support veterans, and yet the taxation for that's going to come in the form of more property taxes to me. So it constrains the ability to pursue liberal reforms, whereas if we had a more progressive tax structure, we would be able to affect these re reforms with less impact on those of us that can't afford to pay it. Okay, um, climate change. So moving from taxation to climate change, we should be a, a leader in climate policy. And why do I say that? Um, because we have so much hydroelectric power that it reduces our costs of making climate change friendly reforms relative to other, case, uh, other states. So we're sort of a natural leader. Um, and it should be a primary theme of every session, not because I so say so, but because scientists say that this is a pending emergency. Um, and there are some benefits to having sort of a solid West Coast block of states working concurrently on climate change. So the province of British Columbia, for example, has a ta uh, carbon tax, so does California. We're a little bit of a laggard in that front. Oregon's trying to pass one as well. Um, so there are progressive things happening in all these states, but it certainly makes sense for us to catch up, uh, if not become a leader in this movement uh, for the West Coast. Um, and it also makes sense to divide climate change policies into two categories, breakthrough structural changes versus more incremental changes. And the final point I make, I'll make on this slide is um, COVID-19 represents in part a catastrophe attributed to not taking science seriously. And that's sort of phase one. The Economist magazine uh, this week put out a cartoon that says, and it shows a boxing ring, phase one is COVID-19 beating up the United States and we're ready to enter the ring for, uh, for round two is climate change, okay? So we need to take this threat very, very seriously, okay? Um, all right, so what are some breakthrough climate policies? Um, I've listed 10, these aren't really my 10, this is just observing what's happening around the country and the world, what are sort of best practices, and where do we stand relative to those best practices. So briefly, uh, a 100% renewable powered electricity grid. We finally passed that um, in 2019, uh, which is good. Make coal illegal for electricity production. We did that in 2019. So these are green, those are the only two of the 10 we've passed. Statewide price on carbon, we don't have that. Uh, it's been introduced but not passed. Banning the purchase of new internal combustion vehicles at some uh, future date, 2030, uh, for example. That's been introduced but not passed. Uh, one that I think is critical, mandatory K-12 climate change curriculum in our public schools. Just teach them what science says. And if it's 98 to 2, then teach, here's what the 98% teach, here's what the 2% teaches. But it is a 98 to 2 ratio. Um, that was introduced this year, not passed. Uh, make new fossil fuel structure uh, infrastructure illegal. Uh, there was a partial bill on that, sort of small on shorelines, but it didn't pass. And then public fleets, um, green energy business cluster, divest from fossil fuel company investments, support massive investments in renewable energy, those haven't uh, passed. So we're lagging in this area, okay? Um, this chart shows what happened last session in climate change. I've divided bills into ones that passed, ones that didn't pass, major and minor. And I'm not gonna cover the minor ones. Briefly, I'll talk about the major ones. There was a bill uh, to increase uh, the number of zero emission vehicles sold in Washington. That's a good bill. Uh, new state standards for greenhouse gas emissions to comply with uh, new science projections. That's good. A bill to uh, support carbon sequestration in uh, more rural areas passed. So these are good things. But there's way too many others that are big that didn't pass. Uh, a carbon tax didn't pass. 
a clean fuel standard to make uh, fuels that are burned for transportation less carbon intensive, that didn't pass. Ban on the purchase of new vehicles didn't pass. Uh, giving the authority uh, to the Department of Ecology to regulate carbon emissions from indirect emitters like refineries didn't pass. Um, uh, K-12 education didn't pass. Uh, addressing climate change via the Growth Management Act didn't pass. Declaring a, a climate emergency in the state of Washington didn't pass. And the HEAL Act, which is important, which deals with the disproportionate of impacts of climate change on lower income minority communities and trying to develop means to address that, that didn't pass. So some successes, but way more failures in the last legislative session. Okay, other environmental bills. Um, I think I'm not gonna go through all the details on, on this. There's a, a plastic bag ban that's being repealed because plastic bags are more safe in the COVID environment than you bringing your bag back to the supermarket. So this is passed and repealed. Orca protection, ban on suction dredge mining, um, ban the box pilot program, a water rights bill to protect uh, outside parties from speculating to make financial gains on water rights without being farmers or other people with a vested interest. Bills that didn't pass, uh, create creation of a federal nuclear waste repository for Hanford. Uh, funding to study rail transportation, a shoreline management act uh, to ban fossil fuel inf infrastructure on shorelines, uh, and a full ban on single-use straws. So some other vi environmental bills. K-12 education, uh, McCleary, um, a decision that forces funding to change for public schools from the local level to the state level. That's largely in place. There's still some issues with the underfunding of special education and the underfunding of wraparound services. Um, there was the passage of a K-12 sex education bill, controversial, especially in eastern Washington. And there was a bill to fund charter schools at the same level as K-12 schools, which didn't pass. People that don't support charter schools, of which I am one, uh, are, you know, presumably somewhat pleased by that. Okay? Healthcare, again, I'll just be brief. Some last minute, excuse me, funding for coronavirus, but, but certainly inadequate. Um, some work on in insulin, amongst other things, to cap the monthly cost of insulin at $100 a month. Um, there are some other things that you'll be able to take a look at. There are a number of bills that failed, including, problematically in my opinion, one to study a movement towards a single-payer universal health care system. So I would have liked to have seen this pass. Uh, also, there was a proposed ban on ongoing flavored vaping. That didn't pass. Um, so, some progress in healthcare, but not a lot. Social services. Um, prior to the pandemic, the Trump administration, of course, is cutting uh, benefits in the social services to the states. So, we get hit hard by the Trump administration, and then in the final hour during the COVID pandemic, it tries to emerge and hold itself up as a champion for the states uh, for providing uh, relief packages, um, which is somewhat uh, hypocritical in a sense. Um, some more funding for homelessness, um, and then some bills on financing issues that deal with uh, zoning, which I won't go into here. A little more funding for foster care, uh, but not enough. A brief update on social services. Our elections are um, national class now. Statewide mail-in with prepaid postage, that's a great thing. Uh, there was a bill to modernize redistricting, uh, which did pass. Um, increased accountability to limit gerrymandering, that didn't pass. Eliminate, eliminating advisory votes on the ballots, that didn't pass. These are the long explanations in your voter's guide for whether your voters are going to recommend a, uh, a taxation bill uh, continue to operate. A lot of people think it's a waste of time. Anyway, to get rid of those, that didn't pass, and felony voting rights were not approved. I certainly approve having voting rights for ex-felons. Okay. Um, data privacy. Uh, so, uh, Reuben Carlisle uh, has a bill to protect your data privacy, um, uh, especially on social media platforms. That failed, but there is a bill that passed uh, that um, uh, limits to some extent the government's ability to use facial uh, technology and AI. Uh, so that did pass. Um, there was a bill to restrict the release of birth dates for public employees. That did pass. Um, title only bills. These are bills that are introduced early in the session that have no substance. 
they're just introduced to enable legislators to reintroduce them at the end of the session, past all of the deadlines that they would have had to have met, and then add the substance and then vote on it. So it's a way to skirt the rules. There was a bill to make those illegal, which didn't uh, pass. Also, the uh, revolving door bill uh, didn't pass in Olympia. Uh, gun control, some good things happened. Um, uh, a central office for conducting background checks. Guns banned in child care facilities. That seems like more than obvious, uh, something that needs to happen. Uh, creation of the Office of Firearm Safety and Violence Prevention, but major, major failures. There was a bill to limit high capacity magazines, that did not pass, and a bill um, to ban assault weapons, that didn't pass. Those were probably the two primary objectives to pass, was to pass those bills by those advocating for gun control, and neither one of them passed. And some other bills, I'll just talk about a couple, increased investment in uh, rape kits, the bill to ban discrimination based on hairstyles called the Crown Act, that passed. Um, limit uh, the use of youth solitary confinement. So some good things passed. Um, there was also a bill to um, look into universal basic income. That did not pass. Uh, a bill to prevent employers from turning down applicants who use marijuana didn't pass. And a bill from preventing immigration officers from making arrests within a, a mile of courthouses didn't pass, unfortunately. Um, so that's just a, a sort of a summary of what happened in Olympia. Um, I will argue, as I'll get to in just a minute, that there were certainly some good things that happened, but most of the reforms were sort of incremental and made a lot of the major objectives weren't realized, and the next session is going to have to be exactly the opposite. Major structural change after major structural change. So, some themes. Um, closing thoughts, timid session, modest goals, modest achievements, and as such, it's a missed opportunity in my view lack of tax structure reform, insufficient progress on climate change, um, no structural change elsewhere, and that leaves the state poorly positioned uh, with respect to the economic impacts of uh, COVID-19 for 2021. Um, and I give the session, I do this each year, I give it a grade, um, and I would give it a D. Uh, and for those that think maybe I'm being too harsh, I will note that last year, 2019, in my article in the South Seattle Emerald where I evaluate each uh, part of the legislature's progress, I gave it an A minus. I thought last year was Im uh, impressive, uh, this year equally unimpressive, okay? And what does that mean for 2021? This is my last slide. Um, and so these are my view of the four key things that happened and these are the four pillars of my uh, campaign. First and foremost, in the midst of these crises, the health crisis, the economic crisis, the social crisis, and the budget crisis, we need to protect vulnerable communities. That's where resources need to go, not across the board basic income where we're paying people who are affluent some sort of monthly check. That makes no sense uh, in a pandemic environment. So protect vulnerable communities. Uh, restructure how the state operates. Um, uh, so I haven't touched on this yet, but we're going to need to rethink how the state provides its services. Not just cut budgets a little bit, completely rethink the models. Um, so, K-12 education, maybe there'll be a blended model of sometime at school, sometime at home with online learning. That might, uh, you might have different groups of students going to school each day to lower density and therefore health risks. Uh, in healthcare, perhaps we can move to a single payer healthcare system at this time. Um, mental health, ac accelerate the transition to community-based uh, healthcare, that's going to be critical uh, in this time where depression rates, etc., are going to go up. Um, and there's many others. I, I talked elsewhere about the fact that cities want to increase density to deal with climate change, but when you increase density, that risks, uh, that has health risks in the age of the pandemic. So these things need to be thought through very, very carefully, and the perspective needs to be not just 5% cut, 10% cut, but how can we restructure the way various services are provided by the state. Second priority. Third, new, progress, new progressive taxation. I've talked about that uh, already. And fourth, uh, deal with climate change. And the key thing with climate change is we need bold, aggressive action, but that doesn't cost a lot. Uh, later, we'll have to invest in bold, progressive action that does cost a lot. But for now, we don't have the resources given the pandemic. So, some examples. The Clean Fuels Program, lower carbon-intensive fuel, 
that's a good program. The HEAL Act to make sure we're addressing the disproportionate impacts of climate change on minority and lower income communities, that needs to be a focus. Banning the purchase of new in, uh, internal combustion vehicles at some future date, that's uh, big and it doesn't cost money now. Mandatory K-12 uh, chi climate change curriculum, very low cost, very big impact, and declaring a climate emergency in Washington State. That costs nothing, it's just a declaration. So those are the kinds of things we have to be doing with climate change. So. Um, that's it uh, for the presentation on 2020 with a look towards 2021. Uh, again, my name is John Stafford and thank you for the time, uh, for taking the time uh, to learn about the legislative sessions and learn more about my candidacy. Thank you very much.